Hi guys, this is part 11 in the GPS specific areas of my build log for SD card MP3 player and GPS for DS pick. I put together the best performing ceramic antenna after the last video which focused on ceramic GPS antennas, so that's the way it goes. This one breaks the rules a little bit. The ground plane is smaller than recommended, but it does work better than the five or so I've put together so far, so I'm sticking with this one. I had an opportunity to make a nice track log in the car. It's a circuit and there's not much stopping so you don't get a lot of that spinning around when you're stationary that's characteristic of GPS's without magnometers. For that little square to the right I pulled into a car park and did a lap and pulled back out so I'd get a really tight turn and see what that looks like. Then I played back the track log on the GPS and recorded it on another phone that has more memory so I can get a longer segment than I usually have been. I'm playing back the first half of the track log at high zoom so you can see all the street names and then a little later I'll play the second half at the lower zoom uh, so you can see the movement a bit clearer. There's a feature that at least exists on Garmin GPS units called declutter which limits the number of street names and labels that can be printed to the screen at once and maybe that wouldn't go astray here. Whether or not you noticed, I fixed that annoying screen blanking issue between frames which exists in this video, and I happen to be narrating from the very same national park right now. I suppose you could call the main focus of this particular video bug fixing. I've been storing coordinates in the map file as binary data for some time now. That's 4 bytes per float, so 8 bytes per coordinate pair. I recently noticed in some areas of a street map you had lines skewed off very far off the screen that were supposed to be part of streets and narrowed it down to some floats not being the way I defined them when read into the program. This is an actual example latitude coordinate that was supposed to be the start of a street. As binary data it's defined as ending in 006 E hex but was actually being read in and interpreted by the program ending in 206 E hex. While the screen blanking issue turned out to be really easy to fix, just a matter of clearing the image buffer at the right time, this one was much harder to locate. This is a file consisting of 100 zero values and that's all. As soon as that's opened and saved in Windows Notepad, all of the zero values are converted to two zero hex values. That'll learn me not to edit my partially binary map file in Windows Notepad. This would be roughly the northeast side of the track log image that I displayed earlier. This makes for a much nicer presentation than it did when I actually took it in the car and recorded it there. Not that I regret that, uh, it was an interesting adventure and I don't think I'll forget it in a hurry. In this video, as well as the rotation being off, you'll notice the road disappear from one frame to the next and then reappear suddenly. That's because at this stage I'm only drawing a line segment if one point of the line segment is on the screen. Most of these polylines in the map will continue to run off the screen like this hiking trail. For performance on a mobile platform you might not want to draw every line in a map file that runs off the screen. It's possible to test every line for an intersection with all four sides of the rectangle that make up the edges of the screen, but I'm not sure if that's the most efficient way to go. What I've settled for right now is to disqualify a line segment if the X coordinate at both ends are off the screen. Similarly, I disqualify any line segment whose Y coordinates at each end are off the screen, be it at the top or the bottom. This way it's guaranteed that any line segment with a point appearing in the screen, or any line segment that crosses through the screen, will be drawn. There are some potential line segments here that could slip through the cracks. For example, a line with an x-coordinate off the left-hand side of the screen and a y-coordinate over the top of the screen could potentially get drawn completely off-screen. For the time lost there in the graphics routine, I'm getting away with only four if-then checks. You do have to use wider limits than just the screen bounds if you want to rotate the screen. More of these MP3 players that turned out to be exactly the same thing in slightly different enclosures. Goodbye, alright. These were both tested to work okay. This one's screwed together and has a fancy LED torch. So we've got exactly the same chip as before. Turns out it can drive a display and it's just a matter of whether they put one in the product or not. What looks like a little speaker, I didn't hear that when I was playing it. I had the headphones plugged in so it would have been nice to hear that if it is a music speaker. 
the buttons were dodgy, tactile domes, and I noticed that you had a directional joypad and the down button was really hard to use. I thought this one was the size of a real cassette when I ordered it. It would have been much cooler if they'd brought a truckload or a container of actual cassettes and made it into that enclosure. So far that's three out of six cheap MP3 players that use exactly the same chip and look like much the same thing in slightly different enclosures. This is a segment of a previous YouTube video of mine, so wait for Silver Chair to come up. Yeah! A really old version of Music Match Jukebox likes to do its own thing with its ID3 tags. Uh, there's a spacing between every character in all the labels. So that was the next fix. Now I've got to actually check for Music Match Jukebox files. I'm temporarily using what was the interrupt timer LED as an SD card activity monitor. My next two videos should be GPS programming standing in front of a whiteboard, a pretty low quality production but I'll try harder than the last time. I can see this project coming to an end quickly now, not quite what I conceived when I was first thinking of it. A novelty steampunk inspired thing and it was going to actually have this porthole wasting a lot of the screen. I'm still planning an acrylic enclosure for it. The original concept didn't include an MP3 player at all, so that's a bonus, I suppose. I consider the MP3 player software finished, although I might come back to those 3D spectrum analyzer bars sometime. 